I feel like shit. Um, I was under the impression that I had to pick three people, so I picked all people, it's not things. Uh, first influence, this guy, Miyazaki, uh, because as everybody knows, I hate Japan and all of its people. Um, this guy has been a big influence for a long time. Uh, early on in the development of Fez, I took a whole entire weekend and I just watched all of his films back to back to back to just absorb it all and just imbue myself with Miyazaki magic. Um, this guy designs spaces and then moves characters through these spaces like nobody else. Uh, most of his films are about, you know, like planes and cars and things that move fast and there's always like, here's a really interesting kind of you know, valley or mountain or something, and the way he just uses space, uh, and the way he conveys things like fresh air and wind in a in a medium like film, uh, was a was a big influence. Especially, you know, um, all the ones that have to do with flying, which is about three quarters of all his films are all planes and blimps and floating this and that, um, and. In uh, starting working on Fez, I knew from the get-go that I wanted to have the kind of Sega, blue sky, green grass aesthetic of the games I liked as a kid. Um, but instead of turning to the, the, the video games that were already a big influence, I just uh, let myself soak in the beauty of uh, Miyazaki's work. Uh, second influence, this guy, Dieter Rams. Uh, he is a super genius, amazing uh, designer. Um, mostly a product slash uh, you know, uh, industrial designer. He worked at Brown in the uh, 60s and 70s and uh, until the early 90s, actually, I think. Um, he designed just the most beautiful, perfect objects that are still to this day uh, a huge influence on pretty much everybody who designs anything. He came up with the 10 rules of good design, which I'm not going to read all of them now because that would be a little bit tedious, but the last and most important rule of good design, according to Dieter Rams, is good design is as little design as possible. And that, to me, is the golden law of pretty much all things, not just design, but also art and uh, pretty much any kind of enterprise, really. You know, it's a keep it simple, stupid, less is more, blah, blah, blah. Um, this guy basically spent his whole entire life trying to make things as simple and functional as possible. He would make a record player that would have, you know, the, the arm and a button. And then that was it. And that's all it needed. Um, if you're familiar with Jonathan Eve, who is the head of design at Apple, Jonathan Eve has basically spent his entire career just straight up stealing from these uh, he's, he's, he's He doesn't hide from it. Uh, and uh, neither should he, because... Uh, it's pretty, you know, if you're going to steal, steal from the best. Um, and this guy has been a, a big influence in, it's, you know, the, the 10 rules of uh, good design to him, they mostly apply to product designs. Uh, you know, one of them is uh, good design should be uh, environmentally friendly, uh, which in designing a video game doesn't really apply. If you're designing a console, maybe you want to use, uh, you know, uh, eco-friendly materials and things like that. But I think that the, a lot of his philosophy applies to video game design in that, you know, uh, trying to make things as usable as possible and have uh, as, as little uh, interference or resistance between the user and uh, the purpose of the thing that you're trying to design. Uh, third influence, Daft Punk. Uh, I love Daft Punk. I saw Daft Punk live in 2007 for the Alive 2007 tour. Uh, and it changed my life. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Alive Tour, it's the one with the big pyramid that just glows and strobes for like two hours and it burns itself into your mind and you can never forget it. It's like the, you know, monolith from 2001 but for dance music. Um, I saw that show and it was such a, it was such a spectacle. Like I was already a fan of the, the music, uh, but the way that he, they integrated it with the the light, the way the show evolved. Basically, the pyramid at first was just a solid color. It would just flash like red or whatever, and that was cool. And then maybe 15 minutes into the show, it would start playing video. And then be like, oh shit, it's not just a lamp, it's the whole pyramid is a screen. And then the videos would evolve, and then the background would evolve, and it would just like grow in complexity. And it was just this, it was the closest thing to a religious experience I've had in my life. It was, I was completely sober, but I'd never been so entranced by anything. And, um, that kind of spectacle, that kind of visceral, immediate spectacle is something that I find is missing in, not video games, but in making video games. 
uh, I often find myself very frustrated, you know, working on something for five years. There is just a payoff eventually at the end, but the whole time you don't really get feedback. You don't, um, you don't see people's reaction. Uh, about a year ago, I started uh, DJing with my friend uh, Rich Lem, who's right there. Um, together we assemble and we become one French guy called Philippe Le Marchand. Um, and uh, it's my new love, basically. It's the most fun I've figured out to have in life is to DJ a party, which I did last night at the Night Games, and that turned out pretty cool. Um, because there is an immediate feedback loop. It's, you know, I, I'm not a musician, I, I'm not there yet. I hope to eventually graduate and learn how to produce my own mad beats. Um, but in just playing somebody else's music, not just playing it, but manipulating it, you know, uh, mixing it together and having people react to it and dance, and then I react to how they're dancing and I change what I'm doing. This immediate feedback loop is so goddamn gratifying. Um, and it's something that's really hard to make in video games. Uh, but recently, Kokoromi, this little uh, art game, sorry, I said art game, uh, collective that I'm part of, uh, we did this thing at Fantastic Arcade just a few weeks ago where we took like nine DDR mats and we made a giant DDR mat, DDR dance floor, basically. And uh, it was a dance party and the people dancing control. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Control the visuals. It was kind of basically just a heat map of the dance activity. It wasn't really a game. It was, it was interactive, but there was no game component. But it was awesome because it was a party, there was a lot of energy, and there was this feedback loop that uh, was really, really gratifying. Oh, and here's the pyramid. I forgot the pyramid. Um, so these are my three um, main influences that I chose today, but I want to give a, a special mention to this guy uh, because he dropped some acid in the 70s and then changed the world over like three, four times, depending on who you ask. And um, he died. He died like a year ago, and now everything sucks. Uh, so everybody should be more like Steve Jobs, I think. That's it. Thank you. Um, hello. So these are my three non-gaming influences. The first one is um, films. Uh, films are really great influences for the type of games I make, which are uh, digital games that are played in physical spaces because uh, films tie in the space characters and story really well. Um, they create sort of, they provide kind of a visual reference for people. Um, so if you want to create some kind of emotion or some kind of feeling that, that you get, the same kind of thing that you get when you see certain scenes in movies, then you can, you can use them as influences um, for games. For example, like if I wanted to um, try to think of like a really intense, you know, person, um, two people fighting, um, I can think of Lionheart, which was a great movie from 1990 um, with Jean-Claude Van Damme. Um, and in that movie, there's, um, he plays a character who uh, is trying to raise money for his brother's family, and he resorts to um, fighting these sort of street fights um, against other people, and then um, there's like this ring of uh, wealthy people around them, um, betting, um, and then also cheering and things like that, just watching. Um, and so you have Lionheart on the left and then hit me on the right. Uh, this is at iBeam Technology, Art and Technology Center. Um, and so you can see that there's like a circle there and like a lot of spectators. And so I really wanted to um, use that as, as the influence for, one of the influences for the games. Um, and then this influence actually went beyond uh, just this game, but uh, actually recently in August we had um, the iBeam um, game research group and Baby Castles, we, we held this joint sort of game jam called Jean-Claude Van Jam where um, people would split up into teams and we had a bowl of flash drives and each flash drive contained a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie and the teams, when they were ready to start, they would come up to the stage, we'd give them a flash drive, or they would choose flash drive from the bowl. They had to watch the movie and then design a game off of that. Um, and then out of that, there were, I think there were like nine different games. Um, it was a pretty successful game jam, I think. Um, a lot of people, um, and, but the cool thing is that there were actually some physical games, so it was very exciting for me. Um, and then another influence is pop culture. Um, I'm 
I was a fashion designer before all of this, and so I'm trained to basically observe popular culture and trends and design off of those things, right? Um, and in, in many ways, pop culture is kind of like my playground. Um, and so one of these things is, um, one example of this is ninjas. And so in Japan, I used to watch, like I would go there sometimes during the summers when I was growing up, I would watch um, a cartoon that's called Ninja Hattori-kun. Or, and then there were other things um, like, you know, in Japan, uh, there's these like sort of ninja palace demo places where you can go and see um, ninjas talk about ninja history and then, you know, and do demonstrations with various weapons and stuff. But what was so interesting to me growing up in the States is that ninjas are so popular in the States, right? And um, I remember like <laughs> Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and then over here you have like this ninja meme, you know, there's four ninjas in this picture, right? Um, and so, and I think that it's in this American fascination with ninjas started sometime here. Can you, can you hear this? So I don't know if you heard the end, but it's like the deadliest art of the Orient is now in the hands of an American, American <laughs> warrior. And then this beautiful American flag behind him, right? And so these kind of things, this is really fascinating to me. And so um, uh, recently I made this uh, photo booth arcade game. And, you know, I used, I wanted people to try to uh, find, you know, basically play this game where they were using their bodies to fit into objects and stuff. And I used a Kinect camera and the Open Kinect um, library for processing for all this. Um, but when I was trying to think of a, a story, right, because these stories are great for, um, especially in public spaces, for people to um, learn the, the game quickly so they, they can participate, um, I decided to use ninja theme. And so I made this cabinet here um, with oversized ninja stars piercing the cabinet um, and created these this bunny character. Um, and the story is that you're the ninja and you are trying to hide from your enemy. So um, uh, you use your ninja magic to become objects in the palace. Um, and then, uh, and then, you know, it, the score is based on how accurately you can become that object. And the more people play, um, the more people who play with you, the better score you can get. Um, and so I was sort of working on that. And this is the result, is that, you know, these are people in these ninja poses um, trying to act like objects here. Um, and then the third influence is systems. And this one's a lot harder for me to talk about, but I'm gonna give it a try. Um, so, a, like several years ago, I was being interviewed for a job and this had nothing to do with fashion design. It had nothing to do with game design, but it was a design job. And they were asking me about this one project I had on my website that was this game called Circle of Friends that I made with a, a bunch of classmates um, in Katie Salen's class, Play Spaces class in 2004. And it was basically um, about this international exchange student who, and we used her as like kind of this case study and then we built a game around her and she, you know, she missed her home but she knew that she was in this new country and what she just wanted to do is keep in touch with people very casually through photographs. And so we made this game called Circle of Friends where you sign up with your friends and you create a circle and then um, you share, a, a, there's a theme for every sort of round of the game. And so let's say there's like a theme like family picnic. And then so everybody uploads some kind of image that has to do with that theme. But nobody gets to see anybody else's photograph until everybody in the circle uploads a photo. And then therefore, um, and then so when the last person does, then finally everybody's able to see each other's photos and they sort of, you know, comment about it and look at everybody's photos at once. Um, and then 
it's really about how long you can keep this circle alive. Like how many rounds can you go through? Um, and it's, so it's kind of like not an intense game, right? Um, and, but that was the whole point of it. Um, and so I was explaining to this guy, this phone interview about this game, and he's like, oh, then, you know, what's your, your influence? And, um, you know, I got really nervous um, because this is actually my <laughs> influence for that game. Um, and I don't mean the oats, really, but I'm actually talking about the religion. Um, and, you know, because it, it was a big part of my childhood, um, although I'm not very religious. Um, but, um, you know, in a Quaker meeting, you sit in a circle and, you know, there's, a, there's this idea of equality and everybody sharing um, and nobody's above each other or below each other. Um, and I, it was actually that system that I was thinking of when we, when we designed the game. Um, and, you know, on a very, like at first, it really doesn't seem like these things are connected at all. But to me, like there's a lot of systems around us. And if we actually take these systems and you know, maybe take the cultural sort of context out of them, there's actually um, a lot of systems that, that can solve a lot of problems. Um, and although they s might seem like they wouldn't, right? Um, and then I think that, um, yeah, and, and so this whole idea of being on, the, on an equal level when you first start the round is, is probably not a, a unique idea, and this is not a unique system, but it, it is something that, this is the way that I could relate to that system, I guess, from my personal experiences. Um, so, so yeah, so th that's basically all three um, non-game influences, thanks. Thank you. Um, so I'm Naomi, and when I started uh, thinking about what I was going to say at this talk, uh, my mind went first to the kinds of things that I've, I've heard people talk about as their influences before, stuff that they find uh, intellectually interesting or, or visually inspiring, or, you know, or maybe they have a story about how when their first child was born, it changed forever the way that they think about games. Uh, but I said, I don't have a baby to, to fall back on in this case, and uh, I, when I think about my influences, it's kind of like a giant compost heap of like everything that happens to me. It gets kind of mulched together. If I was going to try to pull something out of it, it would be like pieces of other stuff would be stuck on it and it would be disgusting. Uh, but fortunately, one of my personality flaws is that I'm very contrary, and I fall back on that instead sometimes. I started thinking about influences that I don't like or that are, are commonly reviled, and it, it got me thinking about this idea of cinema envy. Uh, that uh, creators of games should be wary of trying to emulate the strong suits and the qualities of film uh, so that our games don't turn into enormous, mildly interactive cutscenes. Uh, we should explore our own strengths instead. Uh, but, you know, this gets talked about a lot, and, you know, I've, I've heard people accuse other uh, various games of it. I didn't want to dwell on that too much, so I thought, well, well, let's take a different angle on it. And I decided to call this talk three other media, besides film, uh, that we could try being envious of instead. Um, and they're way too, too broad to technically be influences on my work, although they definitely affect the way that I think about games. And I, I have some complicated personal feelings about them, which I'll share with you. So the first one is uh, superhero comics. Uh, you know, another cultural form alongside film, games, and many others that we could, we could look to. Uh, the, comics are often held up as a cautionary tale for game developers. Like, we don't want to back ourselves into a, a sort of nerds-only niche um, and that we want to kind of struggle for increasing cultural relevance and, uh, and make games for everybody. And, uh, and there are, there's something true about that, especially with the superhero genre of comics, not the, the medium as a whole. Uh, but I think there's really interesting things about how that happened. Uh, when I was growing up, I wasn't really allowed to uh, have comic books. Uh, my family considered them a little too expensive to drop money on with very re little redeeming value. Uh, I'd occasionally get to read some at a friend's house. And by the time I was a teenager, I had turned into a total snob, and I really thought that um, comic books, if they had superheroes in them, they were, you know, sort of for 
mainstream jerks and they were just sort of selling, uh, you know, quote, adolescent power fantasies. I would, you know, parrot lines about that. And I, I discovered through friends that, you know, there was this whole other kind of cool comic book that you should read instead. Uh, so, and of course, some of these comic books are actually sold by exactly the same company, just on a sort of alternative imprint uh, to, to try and capture a different market. Uh, so I, I missed out on a lot of what was going on in superhero comics. I never really read any until just a couple years ago when I got an iPad and started uh, downloading everything like crazy. So I started this project of trying to catch up on the last 30 years or so of comic books. And uh, I discovered pretty quickly one of the things that was very interesting is that comic books have been continuously serially telling the stories about the same characters for an incredibly long time, um, much longer even than some other long-lived forms of storytelling like soap operas. And, um, and so there's little comparisons. In, in Japan, there's definitely some uh, manga and, and anime that have been going on for a really long time. Interesting thing about Gogo 13, which is the longest running serial manga, is that it's had the same author the entire time since 1969. He has a bunch of assistants, but he's still in charge. Uh, and of course, that would be impossible with, with Batman, which has been going for like 75 years now. Uh, and because there are so many different uh, versions of Batman, right? Hundreds of writers and artists have contributed their own creative ideas to the ongoing saga of, of Batman. And that's just in comics, uh, not even counting some of the stuff that's shown up here, uh, it, which are, you know, Batmans from movies and animated series. When you look at some of the modern incarnations of how uh, comic book writers are writing Batman, and you can kind of see that there's this texture like the, the surface of a, the inside of an oyster shell, of many different uh, influences and different Batman from the past kind of shining through and overlapping on each other. And uh, of course, that same process is repeated across all of these different superheroes, a whole pantheon, each with their own distinctive archetypal qualities. A lot of the images you'll see are from DC Comics, since that, that's what I've sort of chosen to focus my important research of 30 years of comics on. So there's breadth uh, in terms of tons of different characters interacting in the same universe and depth in the, the, the long history. But with all of this richness comes some significant problems, uh, a problem that I like to think of as waxy robin buildup. Um, over time, the things get more and more complicated and more and more stories are happening every month and you eventually end up with five robins. This is like a harem worth of robins for Batman. And uh, just to be clear, in case you don't know, the, this is not the, every Robin from like a spin-off and a reboot in a different universe. These are all Robins that were like in the same comic book at the same time. Like sometimes in the same issue, there'd be like four Robins fighting with each other over who's the best Robin. Um, so, and then of course on top of that, there are all these parallel universes in comic books uh, and we're deep in ner nerd territory. And um, a big part of what kept me from getting into this universe for a long time is this feeling that there's just too much to know and to catch up on, too many cross-references, overlaps, uh, to really understand, well, why does this hero have a grudge against this other superhero? And it's very arcane, and, and that's part of what draws this intensely committed audience and keeps people hooked, right? But there's also a barrier that really keeps new people out. Um, then they, so they try to come up with a solution to this problem occasionally. And, uh, and see if they can deal with their, their waxy Robin buildup. So in the mid 80s, uh, I discovered that uh, DC Comics did this thing called Crisis on Infinite Earths. And um, it was ki kind of an attempt to solve this problem, especially if there being too many different parallel universes in, in their story universe. So what they did was, in this, in this massive crossover event that spanned you know, two dozen different comics titles that they were running every month, they, they managed to smoosh together all the different universes into just one universe. So some of the alternate versions of characters had to die. It was extremely dramatic. And uh, DC in the, in the previous decades has been, had been acquiring all these failing comic book publishers. And so they actually folded some of, uh, some of the characters you see here have been folded in from uh, failing companies. And those heroes have been kind of rescued and brought into the main continuity of DC Comics. Uh, so it's supposed to be an exciting event and also a cleanup that would help people okay, feel like they could put their feet on the ground and understand what was going to happen. But it actually, you know, kind of like if you pick your nose too much or you clean your ears constantly, it kind of accelerated this build-up problem because it made it more attractive than ever for readers and comic creators to have all of these uh, he heroes, you know, intersecting and overlapping and have, you know, different uh, parallel realities spinning off of each other. And so that, of course, leads to sort of even more complexity build-up in the story. 
Uh, and so they started doing this on a regular basis. And like every few years, they have another one, one thing that they call a crisis to try to flush out all these different paradoxes and multiple versions of things and uh, integrate their, their latest business acquisitions. Uh, and they, they keep doing this. This is just from recently. They get more and more weird and complicated. Uh, and they actually really remind me of nothing more than the, the reset of uh, trying to reset an online virtual world at the close of a beta or a cycle of play and sort of so that everything can kind of start over. Uh, but it doesn't work that well with comics. Um, this is their most recent reset, which they just did last year to try and they, where they actually DC set all of their comics back to issue number one to try and get across to people like, oh, you can actually start, come and read these things anew. You don't need to know anything. But it's kind of a lie uh, because the thing about superheroes is that it's really hard to get them to stay dead. They have a way of coming back to life and sort of re-emerging from the, the swamp where you buried them. Um, you know, either literally coming back to life or you know, recurring in references to the past, a new incarnation, uh, you know, the son of so-and-so, and, -so and uh, archetypes that come back and over and over. So that's, that's kind of great, especially if you're a comic creator, because there's this rich legacy, like, you know, like you're building on top of really fertile soil. Every time something's forgotten or deliberately plowed under, uh, it sort of mulches up into, into loam for the next generation of stories. And I don't just mean, you know, the, the ways that influences happen in any cultural form, like, you know, how we can see the influence of Super Mario Brothers in so many platform games that have come out since. But, you know, the actual characters come back with the same names a lot of the time. And some of the best and brightest of the living comic creators, like, uh, like these guys, some names you may remember, um, they all kind of got their start in mainstream comics, at least, by, uh, by resurrecting or creating new versions of uh, forgotten and abandoned heroes from, uh, from DC's back catalog uh, of heroes that would pretty much like that nobody remembered anymore. So there's this fascinating process of constant growth, trying to cut back the weeds so that they don't choke new readers, and then mulching up and burying things and then reviving them once again. And it's partly driven for business reasons, right? Uh, in the, the most fertile ground in this whole process is comic books that uh, are constantly iterating and experimenting on a weekly basis. They're very inexpensive and they can try out new things. The, the ones that do really well uh, get collected into graphic novels and occasionally they you know, get turned into a TV series, live or animated. And, uh, and then the big cash cow, of course, is when one of these things de develops enough staying power to get turned into a blockbuster action film, at which point you, really, you can't even really have one Robin in an action m movie, right? That's been demonstrated. Uh, things have to get simpler. You have to, to weed out all this complexity. Uh, but, and, then the re and then, of course, the popularity of the films that have taken comics to a much broader cultural level is why you know, Warner Brothers bought the whole thing a while back. Uh, and all of this stuff sort of goes upstream to them. Uh, so what I find really interesting about this, uh, there's this sort of perpetually metastasizing and collapsing structure that's growing more and more complicated all the time and then falling in on itself. It's made up of all of these archetypes and relationships of um, you know, kind of a modern mythology that uh, has been contributed by thousands of people over time uh, for nearly a century. So the that's super interesting to me, and it makes me wonder like, what kind of applicability it could have to games. Uh, so I, I yeah, look back at this and I think, well, this is all being done for the benefit of Warner Brothers, but what would a creative structure like this be if it wasn't orchestrated on high, um, if it was more like a decentralized bizarre model rather than a, you know, a gigantic cathedral-like edifice? Uh, could you have decentralized collaboration on this scale? Would it fall into even more chaos? Uh, is there a way we could do this with games? And I'm not talking about the, the drive of some virtual world enthusiasts to merge every game and uh, online persistent world in existence into one giant second lifestyle cyberspace. In fact, I'm not really talking about it on the level of characters or stories at all, since uh, that's been done a bunch of times in nerd culture. I, I think about really about weaving together and co-authoring the very fabric of games, uh, rules and structures and economies. And, and we've had games that create short bursts of this, like Flux, where players create and co-author the rules and extend them. They create a structure together, uh, a new game that kind of exists for their, their instance of play and then vanishes at the close of the game, like a little tiny world being reset. And I'm encouraged by the, you know, the appearance of games like this one, uh, Mercury by James Lance, a very promising young designer, uh, where players compete to be able to extend the game and add their own rules onto it. So I think there's something really interesting here 
that's a, a potential seed of, of what our future could be like. Uh, so that's the first one. My second one is music, and I'm, I'm indebted to Kaho for going before me and just having film in general as an influence. And music in general is a huge influence on me. Um, these are the instruments that I was forced to practice at different times when I was growing up. And this is me playing the drums, the instrument that I eventually found that I, I really actually loved to practice. Um, and for me, there's a strong connection between drummer face and gamer face. They both have this uh, a, a state of being transported into intense concentration, the flow of a song or a game, and you, you just become un unaware of how silly your mouth looks in particular. Um, they're, they're both practices for me that have this quality. And I make games for a living, and although I've, I've written arrangements on the drums to accompany other people's songs, I've never actually written music. But uh, I'm lucky in that my girlfriend is actually the lead singer and songwriter in a band. Uh, she's playing in, um, in Brussels right now. And uh, in the last few years, I've gotten to see a real, another side of music uh, in how it's created. And I've always been aware of that you know, people talk about the mathematical structures of music, uh, how chords are related to each other, how certain sounds in conjunction will feel harmonious or dissonant because of properties of the wavelengths of the, of the sound, how certain kinds of chord progressions just naturally feel uplifting or wistful or dark, and rhythms can, of course, be kind of lilting or driving or tense and have all these qualities, partially because of the cultural connotations, but, but definitely at some sort of deeper level of uh, how they affect our brains and, and what our ears are used to hearing. And of course, there's things like the dizzying formal structure of a fugue elaborating on itself. Um, and uh, th this stuff is super fascinating to me, but I never really had a direct line into it. Uh, but the, uh, above the level of math in music, and some people do say that, you know, all music, when you get down to it, is math. We all know at a deep level, however, that the reason music is so popular and so compelling and widespread has, also has to do with uh, the feeling that, that people who make music bring to it. And it, it's not just a technical exercise to activate human neurons in a certain order. Uh, so when Bruce Springsteen got, gets on stage, it's not just that he has mastered the form of, of melody and rhythm, or even that he has creative ingenuity in, in coming up with a new sequence for those things uh, out of those tools, but it's the powerful emotion that he's known for uh, per being on stage with, uh, whether he's performing his own songs or, or covering someone else's songs, right? And it, it wasn't until I got more involved in music that I became aware of how intense this alchemy is, uh, of how uh, at the core of it, making music is kind of a collision between math and feelings. Uh, and that's, that's what I think is really magical. And I realized, wait, wait, this is what I love about games, too. It's like a car crash of math and feelings. We can create a structure out of numbers and logical relationships uh, and systems of formal properties. But wow, when feelings are get into that mix, too, uh, we play and make games and get excited about what's happening in a game because they grab hold of our passions. Uh, and so when I talk about being envious of music, I'm really thinking about music and games more like siblings. Like, so film is the sister who we've been compared to for a long time, and, and then we're, we're found lacking compared to some qualities of film in an unjustified way until we grow up a little and realize that we have to define ourselves for ourselves. Uh, then maybe music, I would suggest, is like the, uh, the much older sister. We didn't really know very well when we were growing up until we started having conversations and realizing that there are some things about each other where we can, we can learn from each other. Like when we get together with a, a, a relative and we see, oh wait, you have that same annoying tendency of like cutting people off when you get angry that I do. Um, so they could actually tell us a lot about ourselves, right? Where, and that's true of siblings, and I think it's true of, of different cultural forms, too, even if we're not going to try to emulate them. So take Dean Martin. If you're familiar with Dean Martin's music or with swinging lounge, lounge music in general, you can kind of uh, imagine to yourself what a Dean Martin song sounds like. And you might be familiar with this song as well, a classic French nursery rhyme. Or if you know how to read the formal structure of music as visualized, uh, you might even be able to look at this and sort of hear what, how the song goes. And then kind of imagine those two things together. So imagine Dean Martin singing Frere Jacques, like, um, Frere Jacques, Frere Jacques, dormez-vous, baby? You know, like that. And uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. So th there's some magic here, which I think that games and music could both share. Uh, every player of music brings their own interpretive touch to the established structure of the song. And that, but the song can still be perceived through it. You still know that that's Frere Jaca. 
I think this is worth thinking about with games because games are also things that come to life every time they're played. And every time the player brings something of themselves to that performance, even if it's just inside their own mind and how they're interpreting and understanding what's going on and modeling the systems of the game internally. Now in music, we can't help but recognize the emotion or lack of emotion that a performer brings. Um, but in games, on the other hand, sometimes I worry that we spend too much time creating these beautiful, intricate devices that are the equivalent of player pianos. Uh, they can re reproduce an amazing, wonderful, interactive composition by a, by a creator, right? But every time that they, they step through the, all of the, the structures that have been embedded into them, they play out the same way, regardless of who might be sitting in front of them. And I, I don't mean that they play out exactly the same, like the same choices, but the, the possibility space is identical. And the, a player can put their fee, uh, fingers on the keys, feel some of the experience of creating that meaning, uh, and feel like they're participating. But unless you completely disrupt the performance and pound all over the place, uh, or hack the system, there's very little of the player's personality, emotion, or creativity in some games. And I, I think that there's a, there's a huge difference for me between games where you really sense the, the player's personality coming out strongly, and when you watch a replay of a game like that, it's, a, it's entirely different than when you watch a playthrough of a game which is going to look the same or feel the same when watching, regardless of who's playing. So this is what I find interesting and relevant about music. It's a cultural practice that can fill up your life with collisions of math and feeling. And that happens not just when the, those, the, in the moment of creativity when the music is written, but also in every single expressive instance of every time they're played, even the oldest songs, we play them again and again uh, if they have power in the music and power in the performance. And so much so that the entire music industry is built on replaying recordings of music over and over again, right? So what would it mean for a game to be this good? And I, I think we're definitely very close with some games. Um, and you know, maybe this is one of the qualities that, that makes the game uh, achieve the level of a sport. Uh, I think I'm running way over now. John, what do you think? I have, I have my last one. Okay, so <laughs> final one. This is, now I'm cheating and this is not actually a cultural form, uh, but I'll run through it quickly. These are ideas that have been rattling in my brain after being exposed to some evolutionary biology. This is my dad, he's a microbiologist. He's spent his whole life working towards a deeper understanding of how the immune, human immune system works to try and uh, pursue cures for things like HIV and cancer. This is my dad's favorite evolutionary biologist, Richard Dawkins. He's very well known for being a prominent atheist. I also think of him, however, as the guy who came up with the word meme. Um, he, uh, as a way of looking at the spread of ideas and culture in a manner that's analogous to how biological traits survive and thrive through evolution. And I was watching recently a, uh, a talk that he gave about the purpose of purpose, uh, where he draws a distinction between teleology and teleonomy. And I'm actually going to skip through this because it's a little boring. But he, uh, he talks about two types of purpose. Archaeo purpose, which comes from evolutionary adaptations, where, where we can say the purpose of a bird wing is that it allows the bird to fly, because that's what functionally happened, even if we don't believe that, that that's why God made birds. Um, and then neopurpose is a term that he coined to talk about some distinctive qualities of the human brain uh, that we can make decisions, plan, and adopt and abandon goals. He talks about how humans have this tenacious but flexible decision-making capacity where we make a series of choices to try and accomplish our ends, but then we have to you know, figure out, like, well, do I, do I stay on the same course or should I do something different? How am I evaluating my environment to see uh, how I'm doing? And I got really excited by this because I thought, well, games are a lot like this. They have tons of qualities related to neopurpose. You have a goal or objective in mind in a lot of games. You adopt or discard strategies in order to try and reach them. You can play tenaciously or flexibly and so forth. And so here's Dawkins' story about neopurpose quickly. So over millions of years, the human brain was getting larger. And part of what made this worthwhile evolutionarily was that it was, it was developing this huge capacity for neopurpose. And what neopurpose allowed us to do, among other things, was to mimic the archaeopurpose traits of other animals. So we like literally ripped off the, the claws and fangs and bones of animals to make tools for ourselves. We literally ripped off their furs in order to make clothing to keep us warm um, in our relatively hairless skins. And we could uh, you know, put, pick up and put these things down whenever the circumstances dictated. 
And then we continue to do this across human history until we're able to make some fairly amazing adaptations of our KO purpose, uh, an airplane wing you know, based on some f facts about how birds are able to uh, fly. And then Dawkins winds up this tale by saying, well, we eventually got to the point where we we're making machines that can emulate our own evolutionary advantages, the large brain and the capacity for complex decisions and revisions to those decisions. So we're actually sort of making these neo-purpose machines now called computers. So this is the, you know, what the story looks like if you, you chart it out. And I thought games really deserve to have a place in here too. Um, because at some point in the story, the unstructured play that we see all sorts of animals engaging in uh, turned into this more structured kind of play with rules and goals and choices and strategies. And uh, because the brain is highly plastic, these evolving structures of play from the very beginnings of human society must have played a role in shaping, shaping the brain and shaping the human neo-purpose capacity and then being shaped in turn um, as games evolved. So, Here's, here's my proposal that we should sort of try and claim our role in the saga of human origins, even say claiming that there's a loop here that illustrates how games are part of the biocultural human organism, that you know, maybe games actually made uh, Neanderthal brains larger. And uh, it, if you look at where this story ends up, you can also see how the appearance of digital computing creates another step on this chart that we're you know, in a gigantic explosion in the quality of, and complexity of games uh, because of these neo-purpose machines that were created, right? And, and it, it also gets me excited about, well, what does this mean next in human evolution now that we've reached this step? Um, and I don't know, this uh, creates some excitement that maybe games have a, hu a huge unknown role to play. So to be clear, I don't really think that we need scientific justification to explain why we should be playing or making games. It's enough that we do so because games move us and we love them. But it's nice to have a pivotal place in this larger story in the quest of science to give accounts of why things happened. And it's also really handy if you are trying to explain to your biologist father like how incredibly important your work making games is. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you.